Hey everyone, it's Yan Zhao. Tonight I'm here with Sweetcast, also known as Clint Stoker, author of uh, the new hit comic on Indiegogo, Downcast. Hi everyone. <laughs> All right, so this is my first time trying a live stream. Uh, I am a virgin, and like any good virgin, I will attempt to fumble <laughs> through this and hopefully forget it all when it's over. <laughs> it, it'll be good. You'll do good. <laughs> all right. So uh, thank you very much for coming on and congratulations on Downcast. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's been uh, like a pleasant surprise. <laughs> I thought we'd get funded, but um, I didn't realize to what extent. So it's been really, really great. So uh, what's the total... Um, buys like how many how many books have people bought um so we're right around so it's like 760 something backers and that equates to some something like 1200 books uh because a lot of those backers bought multiple copies uh so yeah that, that's a great print run and obviously i'll have to print more just because of damaged books and and things like that so we're probably looking at printing 2000 books wow that's pretty good are you so 2000 and are you planning on keeping some for resale or reissue or sending out to, I don't know, libraries or organizations or anything? Yeah. Um, it would be a shame to just not, I mean, this would be, it, it's such a good opportunity when you can do a print run that size. Um, so for me, like I've always wanted to go to a comic convention and, you know, get a table and meet people and, and sell books i don't expect to make a lot of money at something like that but uh to do something like that it would be pretty important to have the book there <laughs> yeah definitely. so yeah that's one goal and then we'll see how many there end up being you know left but i might even use some for the you know the next campaign uh where there's you know a limited offering of some of the first print books something like that so yeah i want to make it available to as many people as possible and um so it i I think I saw it was 52 pages. Yes, yeah, um, correct. So this wasn't on my list of questions, but you had a um, a, a cast the other day where you were talking about how you prefer to buy floppies and read like monthly books. So is there any plan in the future to sort of break the book up into smaller, smaller increments? Um. Yeah. In well, so. I, I'm kind of weird. I and I found out when I made that video. I'm I think my reading habits are a little bit different than a lot of people's. Um, but I like some books I like monthly and other books I like getting the trade paperback. But in either case, I like to rather than just reading one floppy every month, um, I'd prefer to like collect them for a little while so I can have, you know, sort of like binge read them all at once. Um but um yeah I, I like the idea of having a floppy uh the economics of it for crowdfunding it doesn't really make sense because you're asking mm -hmm. people to pay way too much money really for like a, a 24 page uh comic book it doesn't make a lot of sense um for crowdfunding but i could see down you know the line maybe in the future um when downcast is completed maybe breaking it up and releasing it to uh, you know, comic shops, publishing it traditionally um, and doing like, so each book would end up being two issues. Uh, I do have a nice chapter break in the middle uh, written um, just because I feel like there needed to be a chapter break, but it also does open it up and give us that option in the future that we could release it uh, as separate floppies and put new covers on everything and hopefully release it to a new uh, readership that would otherwise not get it. Hmm. Uh, all right, and that brings up some of the economics of the comic business uh, I want to get to a little bit later. But um, so you're also an author of novels. Uh, you've written The Cause and All for Owen, both which are available on Amazon. Yes, yeah. And um, so those were both more sci-fi, yes? They're, um, yeah, I guess that they are sci-fi. They're more... Um the way that i think about things is well they both happen to be dystopian uh books and um i like deep down in my core i'm a, a ya author um and so okay. 
while there's like elements of of sci-fi um those are to support kind of the you know the the tough decisions uh that people can be put into and so it's not um i remember on my first novel people wanted like really people that are way into sci-fi they always want explanations of the science uh like really sure, in-depth sure. explanations and i hate that kind of stuff uh <laughs> so for it being sci-fi to me it's like well you know i don't i want it i want the story to be first rather than the science not that science fiction does that but um i i definitely am light on the science part <laughs> and and heavy on the fiction well, that if that makes, makes sense. sense yeah sure so would you say that downcast is sort of in a similar vein yeah it's a dystopian society um there is science fiction and like you know the question always comes up is how do, how is this city floating up in the sky how does that make sense mm -hmm. uh well you know there's this element that exists it doesn't exist in reality <laughs> but in this story it exists and it can uh basically control gravity uh, so with that one change to reality, and that's literally the only change, you know, what, what would life be like if this element existed? Um, everything else is, it, it's a retro futuristic story. So this, you, you could imagine it being in the eighties in an alternate universe where there's uh, such an element that exists that can control gravity. Uh, so, you know, you'll see some older kinds of technology in it. Um, and uh you know we tried to make the art styling so that it it kind of fit that vein but it's very um yeah except for that one thing that you know cars fly and you can control gravity uh and have you thought of expanding in the future or is sort of sci-fi dystopian writing sort of your sweet spot um yeah i don't i don't do it on purpose <laughs> um but i guess like all, all for owen wasn't necessarily sci-fi it was um it was more of a post-apocalyptic story but there was you know uh for for that one it was humanity was wiped out by a virus or you know a big portion of humanity um so i have an idea for another story that i'm dying to do and it'll probably be be my next comic uh series besides downcast but that one i would say it's not i would say it's um probably supernatural so that would be oh. it would be a pretty big departure for me yeah uh, so going from novels what made you decide to switch over to comics uh so comics were always um the goal <laughs> with, with writing um i i knew that i mean i liked novels and and things like that prose fiction is great um it's something that you can do by yourself and that's been really really important uh because you don't have to rely on an artist mm -hmm. um it's all on you so if you're willing to put the time in you can do it and all you need is a cover at that point and uh you know it can even look like garbage it still doesn't matter you finished something you know um sure. So that, that that was a uh, sort of why I started with novels, um, but comics were always something that I wanted to do uh, with writing, and so the problem is it just takes money to get started, um, and sure. you can practice writing scripts, but nobody wants to read your comic script, <laughs> you know, because it, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. nowhere near as interesting. Uh, so getting getting the art done for it is crucial. Um, so yeah it was it was more like i don't want to invest my own money into making a book uh making a script come to life when i know it's not going to be great <laughs> so <laughs> right. yeah i wrote a lot of scripts for comics that i've never done anything with because they were just stepping stones they were good learning experiences but i i just don't think they'd be commercially viable uh so you know you don't see all that underneath the the surface uh, but downcast, uh, to me, I thought it was the most viable story that I had so far for uh, a mass market. Um, and so, yeah, and it seemed like it worked okay. You know, people are interested in it. So, um, yeah, it seemed like a good idea. So I'm so stoked to be writing comics now. Uh, I honestly have no desire to go back to writing novels. Oh, Maybe wow. someday, but 
uh, comics are where it's at for me. Uh, so you mentioned pairing up with an artist. You have Ignacio Lazaro doing the art for Downcast. Yeah. Uh, he's so great. How, how was it working with him? He's uh, he's he's great to work with. Um, his style, and this is something I've noticed with artists. I've hired artists on smaller pitches that I would send to Image Comics. And um, I don't have a lot of experience with artists, but he so he would be, I think, my fourth artist that I've hired and worked with. Um, and yeah, each one of them is a little different. What I love about Nacho is he's so good with the storytelling uh, aspect of it. And so I write in full script. And if, if you're not familiar with that, full script mm -hmm. is like panel one. Uh, you know, this is what the scenery looks like. This is the the mood, all that kind of stuff, even down to the camera angle. Um, and uh, yeah, he he was fine with that, but it wasn't his favorite because <laughs> he <laughs> wanted more freedom. Sure. Uh, so we have kind of a negotiated script. I, I still write it in full script in uh, like that. I describe how many panels per page, mm -hmm. but he has full veto power uh, oh. and he he uses that <laughs> veto power um, for the better, I think, for sure. So it's been nice. He'll he'll just let me know, hey, I decided to change this one page into two pages, or I decided to change, you know, this panel. So it's you know totally different. Um, and I'm just ex I expect that to be part of the process and I encourage it as much as I can, uh, especially because he is such a great storyteller. Uh, I picture him as he's the director of this film, uh, you know, if it were a film. And so oh, giving him that leeway is important. I feel like it gives him ownership over the project. Um, but at the same time, I need to have dialogue written. <laughs> Otherwise, right. I feel like there's the pacing. I, I'll lose Solid, the pacing. Yeah. yeah. So I got to have that down. Um, and then and I still end up changing the dialogue afterward. Uh, and you can see like the first first five pages that we have listed on a Negogo. Um, it was really cool how the process worked, but I wrote in full script. He changed it a little bit. And then I'm going back to write the, the script for the letterer, which is Eric Weathers. Mm -hmm. And so I have to make sure that the dialogue fits into what is actually on the page <laughs> versus what I initially wrote on the script. So it's kind of, you break things up a little bit to make it work. And then it, it forces me to readdress my dialogue and, uh, you know, sort of assess if it's really that crucial to the story or not. Uh, so yeah, it's been it's been a really great process, um, and yeah, really great to work with him. I'm really really excited to do not just this book, but you know, we've got plans. <laughs> We're going to continue downcast. So, so was this something you negotiated with him before you started on it, or was it like you gave him a script and he was like, uh, you know? I'm not really feeling this or at what point when someone is trying to find an artist, should they bring things like this up? Uh, I mean, I think it depends on the artist and kind of where you are in the project. This one, um, like I had talked to him and we met on DeviantArt and I talked to him um, months before I, you know, hired him and we mm -hmm. talked a little bit. I actually ended up hiring a different artist first and I regretted that decision <laughs> pretty quickly. I, I remember those videos. Yeah, it was it was it was a nightmare. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I I had to end that one because I knew I didn't have confidence in it, in any that anything was going to get done on time. Um, yeah, it, it was it was not good. Uh, so then I went back to Nacho and I was like, "Hey, man, uh, really?" I looked at his portfolio again. Still love it. Um, I asked him if he'd be down to do it and he was like, sure, just send me, you know, some of the descriptions or something and, you know, let's get your, let's get your cover first. Um, and so when I first sent him the script, this is back to your in initial question, but I sent him the script, he looked at it and he was like, um, this is nice, but I prefer like a screenplay mm -hmm. script. So, uh, I looked at it and I thought, I said, I'll give that a try. Um, I had written a little bit of a screenplay before, but I don't again, like the pacing gets away from me if I don't sure. have it broken down. So um, I just said, hey, can I just write in full script? I'm going to have panel descriptions, very short, 
like I uh, deleted all the extra stuff, just the initial, the essential nugget of what needs to be in there. Uh, and then you can, you have veto power. So he was cool with that as long as he knew that he had the freedom. Uh, and that seems to be working for us really well. Cause then I can, I get what I need and then he gets what he needs. So, so far so good. Yeah. That was kind of one of the issues I had thought about with, uh, the CG community where it seems like one person is kind of hiring the other, but when you think about classic comic book runs, it was always a pairing. You know, yeah. it was like Chris Claremont plus Mark Silvestri or Jim Lee or, you know, one of the Adams. And it, it seemed like that pair had to come together for a synergy. And I'm kind of wondering just in the it, just in the current environment in general, how that's going to work when one person's paying. Yeah, it it's tough, man. It it makes it hard. I can only speak from a writer's perspective, but I it's tough because you you want to just be the creative person and just write mm -hmm. and get into that creative team at the same time you have to be the boss and like i said i i fired the first artist i hated doing that uh, it felt terrible but from a business standpoint and knowing like this book needs to get done and it needs to get done well and on time and all that kind of stuff i knew i had to do it it was tough um but but it is hard. It's one of those I've just come to accept it as part of the reality of indie comics right now. Uh, and for the foreseeable future, uh, if I can get good at that and not only being the the writer, uh, but also you know the boss, I guess, or manage mm -hmm. project manager, uh, then that opens a lot more doors for me. I don't see myself ever working for Marvel or, or DC. Right. Right. But if but if I want to make a career out of this, it's like I have to get good at hiring artists mm -hmm. and managing their time and picking the right artist. <laughs> so we have a good relationship together there. They feel happy about uh, the collaboration and all of that. Um, I would love it to work with an artist and, you know, we're just going to split profits uh, back end and we won't worry about anything up front. Uh, but I I don't know, maybe someday when I have a bigger name, <laughs> a bigger sure, audience, sure. and they, I can prove that, you know, you're going to make back end profit. It'll work. Sure. Uh, I mean, that, that's yeah. always a risk, you know, um, somebody with like a Van Skyver or even uh, Zach from Comics Matter, you know, they're going to get some sales just by name value. Yep. So something you got to build up to, of course. Yep. Uh, so you, you mentioned before that there's going to be a sequel to downcast. Um, like how, how many books do you think there's going to be in the series? Uh, that, that's the tough part. Um, what I don't want to do again, this is how the it's, this is how it's changed. You know, like normally, uh, if somebody's going to publish something, I, I guess they change it a little, they change it several times, but it seems like you're going to start a new book, new series or something, or even a creator owned property. You would start with having, uh, like maybe a six issue mini series. Mm -hmm. And then if people like it, you, you continue and you, you just make it ongoing or whatever. That's the way I'd think about it. Uh, in this case, you're getting the feedback from, from the readers at a later point. So I've thought like, ideally I'd love to have three books that do this first main story arc. Uh, -huh. uh and then it would be easy to continue and do another three issue story arc. And when I say three issues, I mean, these big, you know, 52 page, right. 52 yeah, page length. Um, but so what kind of what I'm playing with now is for downcast two. uh, wait to hear how the first one was received and then, uh, launch it on, on Indiegogo. And if it does well, uh, money wise, if it sells well, then I can make sure to make that ending work for a three issue arc. Like uh, I want I gotcha. to, if it doesn't do well, um, the nice thing is I can I can just write two endings and I can also just wrap it up nicely after that second issue. Uh, so this is a really weird game to be playing. Um, but ideally, I really hope that it sells well because I want to do three okay. issues and then we'll see like it could wrap it up nicely, but we could also add another story arc. I think that would make sense. So, um, so that kind of brings up another question. People always talk about comic books as stories. But I sort of disagree because traditional comics, Western comic books, 
I see them more as like Viking sagas. They're stories that never really end. Like Superman will never end. X-Men will never end. As opposed to a story which, you know, assuming you're into three-act structure, you have beginning, middle, and end. So yeah. do you, do you, where, where do you see the industry in the future? Because when you have two large companies that are publishing everything, obviously they never want those to end, right? So they have yeah. to be more on the saga um, scale. But now, do you see people as maybe starting to, like maybe you would have four issues in a series, but the series has a definite beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Um, I think a way that, I don't know, I think it's been, it's definitely been done a few different ways in comics. I think the way, like ideally, if I was just in charge of everything <laughs> and I knew that uh, like people wanted to read uh, Downcast for five years or something like that, mm -hmm. um, then I would probably do something like, um, like you have, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end for each story arc. Uh -huh. uh, but you want to sort of sow the seeds of the next story arc before right. the first one ends. So, it, it, you know, although you've resolved this one issue, uh, then, then there's another one. So it, it'll, it'll make sense logically why you have another story arc. Right. Uh, so that's how I would do things. Um, and I'd probably have, gosh, man, if I could do it any way I wanted, if I have three issues per story arc, I'd love to have three of those story arcs. So there'd be, nine, nine of these big issues total yeah that'd be great because then you could actually have each of those story arcs uh work as a beginning and a middle and an end they kind of amp up things so sort of within each of those you're still going to have you know you'll still have a three-act structure if you're you know if you're cognizant of doing it that way um that's not always how it works though sometimes it feels like they just go on and on and on <laughs> there's no no resolution whatsoever that's how the walking dead feels to me the the tv series it's, um. <laughs> yeah you know i have to say well i was going to bring up manga later but over in japan things have a almost always have a definite beginning middle and end and including the tv shows so it's nice when you just watch 22 episodes of one thing and it wraps up as opposed to like the us where something gets popular and it just goes on way too long and you're yeah. like why am i watching this yeah, it, I, you're exactly right. That's um even with Hellboy, which is a long mm -hmm. ongoing series, there's still a defined ending. You know, we haven't seen it yet, uh, but you know, Mike Mignola has said that he's going. He already has an ending for it. It's going to end, uh, and I I love that. That's how mm -hmm. even with Downcast, um, I can depending on <laughs> demand again. This is a weird place to be, but I could make that ending be issue two. Uh, if it needs to be and uh, you know, but there are other sort of stories within the, the overall arc that I'd love to tell. It'd be awesome. Uh, and so if I could do that, then it, it would still have an ending though. I, I can't imagine it going on just endlessly for decades. <laughs> like a lot of comics uh, do. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so we've been talking a lot about story and story structure, which is, one of the reasons I wanted to start the channel. And there are a lot of people, um, not just in comics gate, but in independent comics um, and in other areas, even uh, games like Dungeons and Dragons and whatnot. And they don't come from necessarily a, a writing or a literary background. Uh, and I was just wondering what, um, how much of a difference do you think it makes to have good story structure for like comics or, or D and D or whatnot? Uh, it's, it's definitely important. Um, it's, uh, like you can get in and just ramble, <laughs> um, and, and make your stories kind of meander. It's not, I don't enjoy reading stories that way. Um, I, I wouldn't enjoy writing them that way either. Uh, maybe some people do, but uh, story structure is important. The thing that I feel like you'd need to avoid, though, is making it uh, too formulaic mm -hmm. with that structure. Um, you still want to let people forget what's going on and get involved in the story. And it, you know, it it doesn't take a lot to do that. Something I I like to do is um, 
sum it up. So even with with downcast, I have those short pitches. I have like the the one sentence thing at the beginning of the campaign, and then I have down further. It's like a, a two sentence can uh, two sentence uh, description. Uh, those are good even from the get-go before you actually start writing to describe what it is that the story is going to be about uh, because I always try to measure, okay, what I'm writing right now, is that meeting this overall goal that I said it was going to? If it's getting too far off, then I need to you know, rethink about things and, and go back to the structure. Uh, but you still got to also allow yourself to be creative and, and have some you know, freedom with it. That's the cool thing about comics, especially indie comics. Um, you, you do have that freedom if you allow yourself to have it. So I do think it's a little bit of a balance, but uh, you should have a, a definable story structure for sure. Uh, so for people who are, um, let's say younger and they're coming up and they're more on the visual art side, uh, maybe somebody who's in your Michael Turner challenge, what, yeah. what advice would you give um, story-wise? Like what would you, what advice would you give to new writers? To new writers, um, the, the big thing is you have to write a lot to get even just passable at writing. Um, <laughs> the thing is everybody thinks that they are, if you have good ideas, you're a great writer. Uh, and that's great to have good ideas. But um, when you have more experience, it's really, it's really helpful to be able to look back at stuff you've written and identify that there is a problem and identify mm -hmm. what the problem is. And so um, I, there's two things I would say. One is you have to write every single day, uh, even if it's just a little bit. And even if you have writer's block, write something, um, make, make progress on a story. But then you also have to get critical feedback uh, on the writing. And I wouldn't, you know, it's nice to get like your significant other to read it. Uh, oh, but if no, <laughs> yeah, the, that's, the, that's terrible because they will never ever <laughs> say something's bad because yeah. they don't want to start a fight. Uh, th and they also might not be a writer. Well, that's <laughs> true too. Yeah. Um, so like getting, getting perspective from somebody that's a reader or they read a lot, that's, that's great. That can be helpful. Um, usually they can identify that something feels wrong, but they might not know for sure what it is. Like mm -hmm. your main character, I just don't care about them. They're boring or they're annoying. Okay, but that says something. So a trained writer would know, I got to go back and, and think about character development. What what things can I do to, to make this uh, character more compelling? Um, so when you have somebody that is a writer, and that's why writers groups are so important, uh, they don't have to be, you know, a professional writer, but somebody that understands storytelling and the craft and they're working on it, that feedback is valuable. Um, and e if you don't have a writer's group, there's tons of resources online, especially YouTube. You can watch uh, lectures from uh, you know professional authors mm -hmm. that'll talk about this stuff. They don't have to be in comics. Comics writing stuff is nice. There's some unique things, uh, but storytelling is the same <laughs> throughout any medium. It is the same. And so if somebody is a prof you know they're a professional, uh, novelist you're still going to learn a ton about storytelling if you listen to one of those lectures and really try to apply what they're teaching you mm -hmm. yeah neil gaiman just did a very nice series for masterclass oh yeah i saw that i haven't seen the masterclass but i've seen his ads for it uh yeah i actually got it the other day and i'm like four lessons in but uh it's actually really well done and, and well thought out i would recommend it for anyone you know especially um, if you're not on the literary side, if you're more on the art, there's always difficulty with, uh, miscommunication between the visual and the literary side. So I always recommend each side, try to understand the other a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, love that. That's again, like the Michael Turner challenge that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't, you know, expect that I'm going to be professional by the end of the summer, but I do expect that I'll understand art artist a little bit better mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that's like, helpful. Yeah. Um, so here's something, uh, a lot of people ask, um, you know, if you look at movies, all the actors want to play the villain because of the juiciest parts. So what makes a good villain? Do you think, uh, villains, you need to have, um, 
you need to develop their characters <laughs> just like you would with a, a main character. The nice thing is that it almost feels like you have a little bit more freedom to do that because you're not worried about likability, <laughs> you, sure, you know? Sure. So, so it is, um, yeah, you st but you still want to develop them. You still want to show, I even know with downcast, it was like early on, I'm, you know, introducing the, the main villain. Um, you got to have a way to show the audience what that villain is like. Uh, so for example, I think of, uh, the dark Knight. uh, you've got the Joker toward the beginning of the movie. They do the bank heist thing. And at the end you find out, you know, he pulls off the mask and he's one of the goons. That's actually the Joker. And so it's, it's a fun sequence, but it's showing you some important things about the Joker. One is that he's really, really smart. Mm -hmm. He's clever. He manip manip manipulates people. And then also that he's ruthless, you know, he's willing to kill his own men. He does not care. Uh, it's all, you know, part of the game for him. And so in that sequence, you think it's about, um, you, well, you might think it's just about, oh, this is a cool, uh, bank heist scene. What that really is, is it's character development for the Joker. Um, uh, and you even have, uh, other characters defining, uh, your villain. You'll do the same thing with your main character, mm -hmm. uh, rather than having lots of exposition, uh, like you'll have, you'll have some of the, you know, the clown crony guys, like they'll, they'll be talking to each other as they're trying to break into the vault and they're talking about the Joker and that he's mysterious. And they'll just give you those little tidbits of information. Mm -hmm. That whole scene is just defining who the Joker is. And so you can do that same thing. You just got to think of how you're going to show that rather than tell people straight out what it is they need to know about your villain. Yeah. That's kind of one of my current pet peeves with most Marvel comics. Yeah. <laughs> They'll just tell you like, Oh, she's the best at this or whatever, but she never does anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. <laughs> Some, sometimes it's terrible. And th this is why um, I, I'm really adamant about to learn how to write comics. Well, uh, I mean, reading comics is good. Reading from the best comics writers is, is great but you still should be reading other stuff besides comics outside of the medium. Again, it's still storytelling. Movies are still helpful if they're mm -hmm. again, if they're done well. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't be just telling your audience everything they, they, they need to know. You got to show them, find ways to show them. And if I hear we have to talk one more time, I'm going to strangle <laughs> someone. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of brings me into another question. Um, traditionally, we didn't have these things as much in comics because we had people they like to call editors. Uh, and these days I couldn't tell you what an editor does because so much stuff, I, I would say slip through, um, you know, the game of Thrones had that, uh, shot with a Starbucks cup this week and everybody's flipping their lid, but you look at a modern comics and it's like spelling errors the whole page might as well just be set in type. You don't even need images because it's all text and the, the drawings don't make sense half the time. So, um, th that's one thing I've noticed about CG, uh, Comiscate in general is I don't see a whole lot of editors on these books and I'm yeah. wondering, um, do you think that's going to maybe become a problem in the future? And, um, how would you find an editor as an independent creator? Yeah. Um, yeah. Editors are really important. <laughs> um, I hired an editor, uh, for downcast. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm working with him there. Okay. So I do think it's important to understand that there's different kinds of editing. Mm -hmm. If you're writing for Marvel or DC, their editors are, they're not just there to check typos and you know, like how many Sure. words or in a word balloon things like that they're there to also make sure that uh continuity is there and uh you know like it, it works with, with the bigger picture and they're also controlling what a character would and wouldn't say kind of right. thing you know what if they're acting out of character so that's one level of editorial uh i think for most people in comics gate that the editor editing that they need is still high level editing but it's um it's about story. It's about character development, that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, having too many words in a word balloon, that that's all important stuff. 
um, that that's something an editor can do. And then you also need line editing. So I would suggest that there's two kinds of editing that you need. It can be done by the same editor, uh, but both are important. Um, so my editor that I hired, uh, he I, I worked with him on my second novel, and that was because my first novel, I thought I could do it myself. And if you look on the reviews for it, I've already roasted myself over it. Um, it's a good learning experience, but the cause was edited terribly. It was, it was horrendous. Um, and that was, it, it's just, it's really is a difficult job, especially sure, <laughs> when you're sure. looking at, at 50,000 words. Uh, so for all for Owen, I worked with this editor. I thought he did a really good job. He's primarily a line editor. So that's really mm -hmm. just grammar spelling kind of stuff. Um, I asked him if he could do graphic novels. I already worked with him before, so I trust him. And uh, yeah, he said he, uh, he would for sure do it. So um, yeah, so I have an editor there. And the nice thing is I'm still controlling. It, it's a little different because I'm controlling the story right. and what is ultimately going to happen. He's not telling me, oh, you know, I don't, I don't think this story works. You should do something different. His job is to make my story work so it's a it's a little different because again i'm project manager i'm paying him uh but still you want an editor that can stand up to you and tell you <laughs> and you expect that you know that's what you want is yeah, somebody absolutely. to tell you this needs something's wrong here it needs to change um and so where would you go about finding an editor if you if you were just starting up your own comic uh, and you didn't have you didn't already have novels published where can you go to look reddit or i mean i don't think there's a deviant art for editors yeah man it, it's tough um i kind of lucked out in my situation it's not like I'll, I'll be totally honest um he's he's more of a line editor and he's mm -hmm. moving into comics and so i'm hoping it'll be good for him and good for me i believe he'll do really well with comics uh -huh. um but yeah there there aren't a lot of editors out there um I think there needs to be though <laughs> in comics, indie comics yeah. in general, there, <laughs> there needs to be more editors. So I have thought like maybe I could, you know, once I've got a couple comics under my belts and, you know, have uh, cut my teeth a little, maybe I'll, I'll offer some editorial. I, I don't know. I, I'm not ready for that right now for sure. But I, I do think that's something that's missing. It's, it's lacking a lot. It would improve books a, a lot. I know you could get editing probably, you could probably Google it and find editors. You just have to be careful. You're not just looking for line editors. You want somebody that knows about writing and right. story structure for sure. All right. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about um, the, the floppies versus graphic novels. And um, Zach, in one of his videos not too long ago, he was saying, Oh yeah, I'm just doing 100% uh, graphic novels. I don't, un I don't have any plans to do anything else. And I'm just wondering, where do you think uh, the industry is heading? So not just for independence, but with uh, Marvel and DC as well. DC recently did, I, I can't remember the name, but it was like a hundred page Superman uh, publication. Do you think the whole industry is just moving that way? Um. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, it would be convenient if it was. Um, the truth is that floppy cells are still leading. Graphic mm -hmm. novels got popular for a while and they've really dipped down in popularity. Um, I, I love reading through graphic novels because it's, I, again, I like to binge read. So they've already done it for me. Uh, floppies, there's just, there's the collectability about it that you can't get. It's not the same. Um, so, I don't know. It, this is hard though, because again, for crowdfunding, I've thought maybe something I could do is, is write and, and, you know, get the art done for a complete like six issue mini series and, uh, you know, launch that on Indiegogo. And then you're, if you're, you know, pledging, you get all six issues. So that way you can charge people enough to raise enough money. But at the same time, people are still getting floppies. Uh, that, is maybe an option it's still expensive because you're you're printing six books instead of one <laughs> so i i'd have to talk to a printer about how to manage that right but I, I think maybe that could work that could be a a solution 
I'm definitely going to look into it because that would, for me, I would love getting six issue, you know, six different covers. That would be cool. Um, but it's, I don't know, depending on how much it costs and trying to make it work economically. Um, it, it's tough. It's, it doesn't work the same for crowdfunding as it does for the direct market. Uh, and speaking of the direct market, do you think that comic book shops as we know them are going to be around in let's say three to five years? Or do you think that maybe they'll have to radically change or just go out of business altogether? I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, there's definitely like things have to change. Um, I, I would say like, I don't know, like, I, I guess think of traditional bookstores, you would think that all independent bookstores in general would be mm -hmm. out of business, but they still exist. Uh, they're, I think, few and far between. They're out there, though. Um, comics, I suspect, will become even more niche than it is. And, you know, they'll exist some places. And I, I think a lot of comic shops, they got to sell magic cards too or you know right. things like that they're into gaming in order to stay in business um but yeah there's definitely big changes it, i be it's hard to ignore how how many stores are going out of business uh and yeah all the changes that are happening i suspect that diamond's going to be in big trouble unless they change something uh yeah i i don't know the solution for it but i definitely wouldn't be putting my stock in comic shops uh no. today Definitely not. You know, one of the the great things about comic shops for me was always that you had this backlog. It was like, I I started liking this series and I want to go find the older issues. Um, but, I mean, can you really think of any comic in the last five years that you want to get back issues of? Do you want to do you want to get the back issues of Squirrel Girl or Captain Marvel? No. <laughs> so so yeah. for me, I'm just wondering, like, well, what are these guys going to sell? You got to sell stuff. Um, that or you have to convert into like half gaming, half comics or half Funko Pop or whatever, half comics. It's it's tough, man. I know um, there I, I actually enjoy playing cards. I don't do it so much anymore, but uh, I, I've been pretty into uh, Magic the Gathering and I'd go with my brother on Friday nights. And there was this this shop that we went to that sold comics and they did magic there. And it was weird to see their comment section getting slower and slower and slower or smaller and smaller rather. And then one day they just got rid of it altogether and they, they continued as a game store, mm. uh, but they got rid of comics. Um, that was pretty depressing to see. Um, and I don't know, like comic shops need help. <laughs> they, they need a way to get profits. They need a way to get people excited about going and, you know, what is it that you can get in the store that you can't do online? Uh, that, that's tough. I mean, that's tough for a lot of brick and mortar stores. Uh, but I even think if I was to get back issues, like, uh, you know, I'd kind of like to get the run uh, that, uh, can't think of his name, uh, Daredevil, <laughs> Daredevil oh, run. Frank Miller or? Frank Miller, yes. I'd like to get in floppies, uh, the Frank Miller run. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I have one issue. That's it. But I'm like, I'd like to complete that just to have it in, in floppies. Um, I don't know that my comic shop has any of that. You know, like, yeah, most of their stuff is it's more new and it's more garbage. <laughs> um, it, anything worth like, having is taken a lot. I mean, it's great if you need to line the birdcage, but I don't <laughs> know what you want to do with a lot of that stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so speaking of depressing tidings, uh, so about 15 years ago, I was living in Tokyo and, uh, I was there for about three years and I really saw a lot of manga culture. I've never been that big on manga, but when I was there and it still is, the culture was closer to it was here in the 1980s where it wasn't unusual to see people reading comics. Now there it's a bit different because it's very acceptable for adults to read comics and you have comics of every genre, including pornographic, but you have sci-fi, uh, fantasy, you have lots of stuff that women find more interesting. So where did American, did the American comic industry go wrong? Uh, probably in a few different 
places. I think one though, like you, you kind of highlighted it there that uh, th th we're kind of missing all the balance of genres <laughs> that there are in manga. Mm -hmm. That's been a really big difference that uh, I've noticed. Um, and I love superhero comics, but I think that there's a bigger market than that. Um, it, it's comics is a medium. It's not a genre. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's so to me, that's again, like, uh, with downcast, it's not a superhero book. Um, and, and I'm, don't get me wrong. Like if you're writing a superhero book, that's great. Uh, but I do feel like there's a space there for, again, I'm bringing YA it's done really well mm -hmm. with books, uh, for years. Um, bringing that into comics the way I feel like it should be. And the way that I, I feel like it would get more like YA readers into comics is sort of a gateway drug. I, I wish that there were more people doing that. Uh, another example is that campaign, um, the Icarus in the sun campaign. I don't know if you've followed that at all. Oh, yeah. 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 That That's a romance, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> and, uh, it sold incredibly well, uh, romance, N not superhero at all. Um, you know, it was a very specific kind of story and he did his, you know, promotion ahead of time, like he should have, but it just shows that there's still a market for romance, um, Absolutely. Horror, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. I think that there could be more of in comics. Yeah. And it really makes me wonder too. Um, so I'm a little bit older. Uh, my mother growing up in the fifties, she would read romance comics and romance and Western were both pretty big genres until basically all the good authors went over to uh, the superhero comics because those were the big things. Those were who were paying. And somehow we just never got back. I mean, you have a few things like Archie, um, but, you know, uh, so I'm wondering, like, when are we going to start seeing some romance stuff in CG? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That would, that would be, that would be cool to see. I, I think the first person to do it is brave. <laughs> uh, only the, like, it's not necessarily a downside in comic skate, but there's definitely a very, um, like the, there's a certain demographic and a lot of people like a very specific thing. For example, I know a ton of people, uh, proportionately probably over representation. If you want to talk about it that way, yeah. uh, love nineties comics. Um, <laughs> I'm not a nineties comics fan and I'm surprised that I know so many. I mean, it's not like I hated the nineties, uh, but I'm just shocked at how many people love nineties comics in comic skate. Uh, and that's cool. I'm glad that there's a market for that. I would like to see, you know, like, uh, it, it be acceptable, you know, if there was something that was, uh, romance, you know, and people are okay, that's romance. That's cool that there's a, another genre. Uh, I think it would definitely, I think it could happen. Um, I don't know who that writer would be. Certainly not me. I suck at romance. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, so do you think anyone in comic skate is actually sort of taking a serious look at manga and sort of trying to um, reverse engineer what's going on? I know um, I forgot his name. The guy who's doing Tug's book, Kyung Lee. Uh, yeah, Kyung Lee. So he he's done or he's got more of a, like an anime style, but sometimes I hear people in in indies talk about manga and they'll just joke oh i need to put speed lines and you know yeah. and it, it it seems like a very superficial analysis of what's going on yeah um i mean manga is doing a lot of stuff right um and then a lot of that's down to the storytelling uh as far as just how it looks um i don't know like i i was never into manga or anime mm -hmm. uh until I mean, I'm still not really, but I, uh, my brother got me into, he had me try, like, just try Death Note because he thought I'd like it. I watched it and I loved it. Hmm. Um, and sort of some of those, I think there's, there's just the barrier of some of the storytelling conventions that you'd see in manga that you wouldn't see in American comics. Um, that's maybe off putting to some people that aren't used to it. Mm hmm. Uh, but did, you know, it doesn't take long to, you know, get used to it as part of the language, I guess, of how the story is told. Um, but I think with manga, they're not afraid to do really unique stories uh, that 
you know, they don't fit nicely into any kind of genre. <laughs> and so that's why they're almost their manga is just one big genre. It feels like sometimes but yeah. the truth is they have so many unique stories that they're doing that mm -hmm. I feel like in a lot of times in American comics, you can get stuck into trying to fit into a mold. And I'll even say like when I was putting downcast together and the pitch together, uh, I got a lot of pressure from a lot of people. They're like, well, where does this exactly fit? You know, cause if it's sci-fi, you need to do X, Y, and Z. If it's, uh, you know, if, if it's something else, if it's fantasy, it needs to be X, Y, and Z. Uh, and so I don't know, it, it, like just having the freedom to be able to tell a story and put the story first rather than the formula that we're so used to seeing, uh, so often, um, I don't know. I that's what I see manga doing, and I wish comics did it more. Yeah, to me, it's the exact opposite of what's going on in the industry in the U.S., where over there the art is very stylized. Like there aren't that many differences in the manga artists, but there's a thousand different kind of stories. Whereas here we have a huge variety of art, but the stories are all fairly similar. Yeah. People, people like color too. Um, and in manga, you don't see it. Sure. That I'm sure saves time. You can do more of it. Um, I thought about doing downcast in black and white, but like, it's like I pulled people, everybody wants color. So I, I don't know. I'd be yeah. stupid not to. Um, but yeah, there, there's definitely differences. Like you can read for me, like I, again, like I want to binge read. I want to have enough of a story that I feel like I can escape for more than 15 minutes, <laughs> you know? And so that I do think that manga does that well because they're longer form stories that you can really delve into. Um, I don't know how you fix that though. And I've been, I've been trying to think about this, but even maybe having three artists, three separate artists on a book and you alternate, mm -hmm. you know, what, who's doing, uh, you know, which, uh, like someone's doing number one, someone's doing number two, someone's doing number three and just sort of have them rotate as long as those mm -hmm. art styles were all good and, you know, people liked them and it wasn't jarring to switch between the three. Right. Then you could really independently put out uh, books, you know, and, and get a series going at the pace. Yeah. I feel like it should be. Um, all right. So getting near the end here, but um, so we have comics, gate and indies in general. What do you think that people can do better to raise their own profile and the profile of comics in general? um for your own profile you got to find where you fit into things and you got to be make it known so if you're writing i realize writing is a lot more difficult to get known <laughs> for because if you're an artist you can be posting something uh, if you're an artist and you're worried about not being seen uh you, i mean you just need to be posting art every day uh people will see you if you're a writer you got to find something else for me that's was youtube people get to know me uh, better they get to trust you and they're willing to give you a shot <laughs> you know because you got to get that comic made before anybody's really willing to read it exactly so you know youtube is great um it, i'm like i don't think that everybody should have a youtube channel uh, if if you find that it's not your thing uh or you find that you're no good at it or something like that what are you um, implying clint <laughs> not not you at all no you're great <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, a lot of people are like, I've heard them say, oh, I don't want to start a YouTube channel. It's, I want to write comics, you know, maybe Instagram, you know, maybe uh, you got to find something that works for you that you can get exposure every day uh, in one form or another and make sure people know that you write comics. Um, and so how are you going to find to do that? That is important. Uh, and then I think the second part of your question was, how do you raise the profile of comics? Mm-hmm. I'd love to to just see people reading comics in public, you know. Yeah, me too. Um, like it, it would take the stigma away, you know. Uh, I think if you saw more in the variety of people that love comics, just reading it. Um, I remember I took a trade paperback of Spider Man at one point to work. This was several years ago, and I was reading it during lunchtime. And I remember people uh, kind of, you know, teasing me a little bit. But I was like, man, this is good stuff. Like it was, uh, yeah, it was good stuff. So I don't know, like it, it'd be interesting almost to have like a, 
read comics in public day or something like that and everybody just decide to go you know public about reading comics it'd get people at least seeing what you're reading the comics are still being published i don't know talk about it more i guess yeah one of the nice things i did like about japan is they have these places called manga kisa kisa a kisa 10 is a coffee shop or a cafe and a manga kisa is basically they took that idea and they had what's almost a library where you go in and there are thousands of books on pretty much anything you like they've developed now to where you can rent a cubicle you get a computer dvds and whatnot but um these are pretty popular for adults uh especially in cities the trains will end at like midnight so if you're stuck you work late you'll just hang out there all night and then go back to work so it's it's a place uh, where people can go and just read comics and you don't need to feel ashamed. I always wondered if that would be possible in the U S like, especially in college towns where you'd have these coffee shops where people are like, could you sell like a shelf full of comics that you would sell to the, to the coffee store that you restock every now and again, just for people to take and read. Hmm. I don't know. I like that idea. It would be, It'd, it'd be really interesting to try out. Um, I don't know how the, like the cultural differences would affect things at all, but at the same time, it's like, you know, the comic book, uh, superhero movies are so popular right now. Uh, yeah, it, it's like ev people love everything about comics, except they're not reading comics. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, it would be, it'd be, it would be a really interesting thing to do, um, and make it, I guess, uh, I don't know, just hip or public at the least. <laughs> so people can see them, you know. All right. So I, I appreciate taking your time. Uh, last question here. Uh, so your Indiegogo for Downcast is over and it's a success, but the book is still up for people to go buy, which I highly recommend. So for anyone who hasn't uh, seen it yet, what is your elevator pitch for downcast why should i spend my money on downcast yeah uh so downcast i'll give you the the pitch first downcast is about blue collar teens that use the power of gravity to fight their corrupt city their corrupt government in order to save their father from death in prison and uh, you know it's um it is a perfect bound. We've even got like the matte finish with the spot UV gloss mm -hmm. and we're a foil stamp. I've got to talk to the printer, but I want to do that on the logo. It is a really quality book. Uh, it's $15 at the minimum. There's other, you know, uh, other great tiers to back if you're interested. Um, but yeah, it's full color. It's, uh, it, it's something that, you know, this is not just a throwaway kind of, comic book it's a lot of effort has been put into it and a lot of uh you know care in the printing as well so it's it's going to be a really nice book i i would hope that you'll back it if you're if you haven't yet so i have backed it and uh just one more quick question about when can the backers expect them to start arriving yeah so we put on the campaign uh we're, we're keeping uh, expectations low but it's uh january 1st oh, <laughs> so wow. that, that's christmas ways of yeah quite a ways away uh i suspect you should get it sooner than that but um yeah we didn't want to have a lot of the other books in comics gate ran into unexpected bumps Delays, in the road yeah. yeah so i just i'd rather under promise and over perform so right now it says uh january 1st is when you could expect it all right well thank you very much uh for being with us tonight and um is there anything else you'd like to add Ah, no, I don't think so. I really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, having me on for an interview. It's great to talk to you. It's great to talk to you too. So everyone, again, this is Clint Stoker. Go check out Downcast. Bye, everyone.